probably not usual for somebody to have a favorite member of Congress. And it's probably not especially common for it to be a member who served decades ago. Hell, 15 years before I was even born. But Leo Ryan is my favorite congressman in American history, and I feel like his story isn't told quite enough. I can't really think of many lawmakers like Leo Ryan, but I wish there were more out there. The things that made him unique are what makes the story that I'm about to tell so much of a roller coaster. So let me give a little bit of background. Leo Ryan first ran for office in 1955, winning an election for city council in South San Francisco. He had a rough childhood. He grew up poor during the Great Depression, his family falling into even harder times when his father died when he was 11. He previously served in the Navy as a submariner, and after that he became a school teacher. He was teaching English at Cappuccino High School. As a teacher, he was well-liked and kept in touch with students and their families. And as a member of city council, he was consistently re-elected, and it seems like voters really liked him as well. He went with their marching band to the inauguration of President John F. Kennedy, and there he's inspired by President Kennedy's inauguration speech which called on Americans to take action and make their country a better place. Kennedy famously said, Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. This inspired Ryan. He ran for state assembly in 1958 and had lost, and he hadn't run again in 1960, but Kennedy's call to action probably inspired Ryan to run again. This time, with a newly redrawn district, he won. 1962 would be a turning point in Ryan's political career because from then on, he would never lose an election. So Ryan already at this point did not fit the mold of your typical politician. He dressed a little snazzier than most, and instead of going out with a regular crew of volunteers, he had a team of young women in short skirts and go-go boots out to promote his campaign when they're out in public. The team of ladies is also how he met one of his long-term staffers, Jackie Spear. She'll be important later. In the state assembly, he truly developed the defining trait of his political career, experiential legislating. Typically, when a politician is crafting legislation, there's a pretty common process that most follow. They find people or staff with an expertise or passion for the relevant issue. They bring them to meetings with experts and ideally listen to feedback from their constituents. And they give some guidelines to staffers who then write out the legislation. Ideally, of course. Leo Ryan definitely did all of these things, but he took it a step further. If there was an issue he could go experience in person, he would. It wasn't enough for him to just listen to experts or concerned citizens. He had to meet people on the ground, see the problem firsthand, and listen to those who he might not hear from. And he would use that experience to guide his legislation. The first well-documented instance of this came in 1965, when there was a riot in the then predominantly black neighborhood of Watts in Los Angeles. It was a huge news story across the state, and across the nation. It began with the arrest of a 21-year-old man for drunk driving, which was complicated when his mother arrived on the scene. She was very upset at her son for drinking and driving, but also wanted to get home safely, which the police did not allow. A fight broke out where the mother was shoved to the ground by the officers, and the son was struck across the face of the police baton in front of a crowd of onlookers. The story spread from there, sometimes gaining inaccurate details with some people believing a pregnant woman had been kicked by an officer. This was an event in a series of violent confrontations between the police and the predominantly black community. With crime still very prevalent in the area in spite of the heavy police presence, the police in LA at this point were run by William Parker. He himself was a pretty well-known racist and he was famous for his hardline tactics. Suffice to say, the community was already more than fed up with the LAPD and a protest broke out, some of which escalated to violence. Police hit back with even more violence, not differentiating between the violent and non-violent protesters, and a nearly six-day-long conflict broke out with 34 deaths, a lot of arson, and a lot more than we have time to get into in the story. It is covered in the documentary O.J. Made in America in its very first episode, which I'd recommend if you want to learn more about this subject. So, suffice to say, it highlighted a lot of serious issues in California uh, that they were failing to deal with. Now, Leo Ryan did not live in Watts. L.A. is nowhere near San Mateo County. But he didn't really care. He knew this problem was bigger than one community, and he knew that studying this community in the aftermath would be the best way to learn what happened in the lead-up to the riots. Ryan was now a full-time politician, but he went back to teaching. He took a job as a substitute teacher in the Watts School District. While he was there, he talked to the children, he talked to their parents, he talked to the other teachers and the faculty there, 
and he learned more about the school and the issues they were facing there and in the community. He took detailed notes not only of their complaints, but of the poor conditions he noticed at the school district. Ryan became convinced that a lack of care and funding by the state to provide his people good education and other opportunities to the community was a major source of the issues, and that was one that could help solve the issues of crime more effective than heavy-handed policing. Over the next several years, he led a commission to completely reform California's educational system, with his reforms credited by some for attracting better teachers at the state schools. This was the first big step uh, to Leo tackling issues just outside the scope of his district, but it would not be the last. Leo would develop a taste for taking on wide-ranging issues. At the same time, he would still do his best to keep in contact with his constituents, although someone accused him of having his focus diverted. This was largely because of our next story, Folsom Prison. Ryan began to hear in letters that condition in California's prisons were incredibly inhumane, receiving letters and messages from inmates, relatives, and other concerned citizens. Leo again wanted to experience these issues firsthand, but he knew he couldn't just waltz in and get a tour. The staff would see a politician with a passion for reforms walk in and sanitize everything before he got through the door. Ryan had a different strategy. One so ridiculous, it made headlines across the state and earned him political opponents. He was going to get himself arrested under a fake identity and spend time in California's infamous Folsom Prison. Plot work. He was booked to Vacaville, stuffed into a prison van, and sent to Folsom for seven days as a prisoner. He later told journalists that the ride in the prison van was the most fearful experience of his life. When inside, Ryan began talking to his fellow prisoners, earning their trust, and asking them what difficulties they encountered. Now, top levels of the California prison system obviously knew about Leo uh, Ryan's trip, Otherwise, they probably would have been really curious as to why someone only had a seven-day sentence at a state prison instead of a local jail. But the staff at the prison really didn't know this and probably didn't know how long he'd be in it for. They all found that on his last day in prison when he told them he was not only a member of the state assembly, but the chairman of the assembly's committee on prison reform. After experiencing the inhumane conditions for himself, he took note of everything he went through, coming out with 70 pages of documentation and bringing several letters written by inmates as well. Although originally skeptical of him, he became something of a folk hero to the inmates for his guts and his genuine dedication to better their treatment. He was later sent a gift from several inmates, a chess set made of toothpaste and toilet paper. He kept it for the rest of his life. Ryan's prison reform bill was killed by the California State Senate in 1971, but his efforts would help inspire future attempts for prison reform. So after this, Leo Ryan's political career was on the rise, but his strong passion for reform and his unique conduct had earned him even more scorn across the aisle with both Democrats and Republicans accusing him of seeking media attention and craving the spotlight. I should note the people closest to him dispute this and say he was truly passionate about helping people, and he really did believe in experiential legislating. He wasn't seeking media attention, but if it brought attention to the issues he was looking into, he sure didn't mind. And while he was on the rise, his ideology was in decline. Leo Ryan was a Kennedy-style liberal who had lived through the assassination of two Kennedys. He was a Democrat in an era of Republican success. During his time as an outspoken reformer in the California State Assembly, he had to contend with a conservative Republican governor, Ronald Reagan. I found some evidence that Reagan actually had a lot of respect for Ryan in spite of this, but it's hard to say for sure because what comes much later. Still, I think seeing his idols die and his ideology without an obvious voice to rally around probably encouraged Leo Ryan to run for Congress. It was 1972. George McGovern would go on to lose to Richard Nixon in a landslide. But Leo Ryan earned his first term in Congress. He had the help of a district that had been redrawn to be bluer. But Ryan could finally bring his ideas and his style of politics to issues both national and international, which is exactly what he did. Before we dive into Ryan's congressional career, I want to talk a little bit about his office culture and some things I learned. So the worst thing I could find out about Leo in this whole search was his chief of staff was a creep who forcibly kissed staffer Jackie Spear and probably others. But... I couldn't find a single piece of evidence that Leo knew about this. With his chief of staff as the obvious exception, it seems like his crew was full of really dedicated, really awesome people. There's this wonderful little story I really like in Jackie Spears' book, Undaunted, which is one of my primary sources for this video, that I think captures Leo Ryan perfectly. So Jackie was in college when she was working for Leo Ryan, who let her work around her classes. She would hang out with some of Ryan's other women staffers, who apparently forged her a fake ID so she could go to bars with them. She would chat with them about her poli-sci classes, and when she got an A- minus on a major term paper, she told her friends about it when they were out for drinks. One of them wanted to read it, so she brought it in the next day. 
Leo saw the paper and walked away with it. The paper was all of Spears' suggestions about how the office could have been run better. Things like how to be more efficient, ways to get more information out to constituents in a timely manner. So, Ryan sat in his office with the paper for a while, and Jackie thought that he was really mad and she was going to be fired for some pretty frank criticisms of his office. So, Ryan walked out of the office with her paper. He only had one gripe with her criticism, which is uh, she complained that he couldn't get a newsletter out fast enough, which he blamed on the post office. He actually acknowledged most of her criticism and was actually fine with it. But he changed the A- minus on a paper to a C- minus on the paper. Jackie had gone to a private Catholic school that pretty much taught her to use big, fancy words to convey her ideas. Brian's background as an English teacher made him dislike this writing style. And while he told Jackie she was welcome to suggest improvements to the office and he would listen, if she was going to work for him, she had to be a clear and concise writer. And he was going to teach her how. She absolutely agreed. And in between legislating, he would teach her how to write in a more clear and concise manner. So Leo Ryan's stint in Congress gave him more chances to experience issues in person and more chances to push for reform. During this time, Leo Ryan went to Europe to explore NATO's defense capabilities, and there he became an early advocate for green energy, pushing for California to begin incorporating solar power and telling young people they needed to take up the cause of clean energy. He became one of the chief critics of the lack of congressional oversight of the CIA. His most notable legislative victory was the Hughes-Ryan Amendment. Harold Hughes, who introduced the bill in the Senate, was a friend of Robert Kennedy, who was upset with how involvement in the war in Vietnam had escalated without congressional approval. During the debate over the bill, Ryan argued with then White House Deputy Chief of Staff Dick Cheney about Congress being left in the dark, saying if the White House didn't consult them in the future, he might start spilling state secrets every time they strike at a country without notifying Congress. He didn't have to make good on this threat, though, after the amendment passed. Leo also went on one of his experiential legislating adventures as a congressman. He went, along with Jim Jeffords, on a ship owned by Greenpeace to Newfoundland to investigate the clubbing of baby seals. While they were there, they drew the ire of the Canadian government, who viewed it as an internal Canadian issue that two American politicians had no right to interfere in. Ryan was not of this opinion, though. He seems to have believed that America had every interest in animals that swam in the waters that the two countries shared access to. They confronted some hunters, learned more about the issue, and according to Jackie Spears' book, Leo took a picture of himself cuddling with some seals, but I could not find this photo anywhere I looked. So while this was happening, a lot of other things were going on. It was 1978. That fall was a very busy period as far as headlines were concerned. Jimmy Carter helped broker the Camp David Accords, which would eventually lead to peace between Egypt and Israel that September. Less than a week later, a member of the California Angels was murdered. Less than a week after that, there was a terrible mid-air collision in Southern California. And three days later, the Pope died, which was the second Pope to die that year. So there was no shortage of major news, but nobody could have expected the biggest news story that year to take place that November. Not on election day. It was a fairly normal mid-year election, and Congressman Ryan cruised to re-election. The biggest story of the year was going to be the tragic meeting of two names known very well in the Bay Area. Leo Ryan and Jim Jones. And they wouldn't meet in San Mateo County, or California, or the United States. Leo Ryan's next venture in experimental legislating was taking him to Guyana. Most people who know about Leo Ryan, this is the only thing they know about. It's kind of a shame his entire life is overshadowed by this event, but it's not to say I don't understand why. Let's step backwards a little bit. Jim Jones was the head of the People's Temple, which he founded in 1955. It was a church Jones made, combining some elements of Christian theology with some ideas from Marxism and some of Jones' own ideas. It was a call. Jim Jones did everything to win people into his church. He was a fiery orator, and he did fake healings where he'd have people fake injuries like broken legs and heal them in front of huge audiences, making it seem like he was performing miracles. He attracted thousands of followers, starting in Indiana and eventually in 1965, moving across the country to California, where he became even more popular. He had a very diverse flock, in large part due to a strong stance against racism and discrimination. Over time, the Christian aspects of his theology began to fade into the background, and people in the church started worshipping Jones himself as a prophet. Jones was letting the worship go to his head, 
And at the same time, he was developing a serious drug problem, using both amphetamines and tranquilizers to control and regulate his mood. He began to abuse members of his church in every way imaginable. Some people began to leave the church and reported Jones's behavior. He was fairly popular in the Bay Area, but in 1974, a local paper wrote an expose about Jones's abusive behavior and the group's growing worship of Jones's prophet. However, one of the workers at the newspaper was a supporter of the People's Temple and knew Jones personally. She tipped off Jones that the article was going out that next morning. It was well past sundown. Jones reached out to all of his church members late that night. He told them they were leaving immediately. Jones had previously talked about setting up a new civilization in the wilderness. Some members of the church stayed behind, but around a thousand people listened to Jones. They dropped everything, packed their bags, and went to an airport. They left for Guyana immediately. Jones would keep them cut off from American media. Former members of the People's Temple in the States were already beginning to speak out, not only to the media, but several reached out to Ryan's office as well. Soon a group called the Concerned Relatives was formed, looking not only into the People's Temple, but more specifically into their new civilization, Jonestown. Some people had fled Jonestown and reported even more insane abuses by Jones and other leaders of the temple. Leo Ryan was really concerned with what was going on. His resolve would only be emboldened later in 1978, four years after Jonestown had been founded. Bob Houston died mysteriously in San Francisco at his work. It has been reported that he had fallen to his death. His death was ruled an accident, and I should note that it is entirely possible, and the state of California has never investigated it as a murder, but even then it came at a very suspicious time. He had called his ex-wife in Jonestown and discussed getting their children back to America only a few days prior. Bob's father was suspicious that the cult was involved, and they still had plenty of people in the Bay Area. He reached out to Ryan, who had been Bob's teacher at Cappuccino High School. Everything Leo had been hearing did not sit well with him. And whether or not Bob Houston's death was accidental or whether he was murdered by members of the People's Temple, it painted a really scary picture. Concerned relatives said those who had gone to Jonestown would not even consider leaving when they called them. Those who did manage to make it out of Jonestown said ominous things. The temple was collecting guns and arming senior members, and that they had intentionally stockpiled poisons. The Jones would sometimes wake people in the middle of the night, he called these white knights and signal them with the siren. During some white nights, he'd have members sip drinks that he said had been poisoned, only to reveal it was just practice. Multiple members of Leo Ryan's staff warned Ryan not to go. He said that he had to. Someone had to go there and make sure those people were free to leave if they wanted to. Several journalists wanted to join in on the journey. And Leo Ryan also invited any member of the concerned relative groups who wanted to come along. He also took two staffers, one of whom was Jackie Spear. Before he left, Ryan gave Jackie a copy of his will and told her to put it inside her desk. He knew there was danger. Ryan and the rest of them boarded a plane to Guyana. Ryan had attempted to negotiate a visit with Jones, but Jones would not give a member of the American government permission to visit. Jones believed that he was being persecuted by the U.S. government that the world would soon end in a fiery nuclear war and a bunch of other insane paranoid beliefs. All the documentation I can find seems like Jones genuinely believed all this. It was no longer merely a grift. But the drug addiction and continued worship was really fanning the flames of his paranoia, and the slow failure of his commune was destroying his mental health. Ryan chatted with everybody on the plane, promised them that they'd get into Jonestown and that they'd have a chance to visit their family. He promised that if any of their family members wanted to go back home, they could join the return trip and fly back to America. To Leo, this wasn't just an investigation. It was a rescue mission. He was certain that there were people in there in need of his help, and he had a responsibility to them as their congressman. They landed in Georgetown. One of the journalists was immediately arrested for bringing some of the local currency with him, which was illegal for some reason. The hotel refused to give them rooms, so they slept in the lobby. Ryan did not get this far to let someone turn them all away. The U.S. Embassy stepped in to help out. They got the journalist out of jail and got everybody a hotel room. The Guyanese government tried to give everybody one-day visas, but the embassy let them stay longer. The embassy also told Leo that he had nothing to worry about. They had been to Jonestown. Everybody they talked to there said things were great. 
Brian and Spears started making phone calls to Jonestown, setting up a plan for their visit. Jones was resistant at first, but began to realize that Ryan was not going to be refused. Several Temple members came to welcome them, riding in with the Jonestown basketball team, who was set to play against the Georgetown team. After a lot of phone calls and some in-person meetings, Jones kept refusing Ryan. Eventually, on the 17th of November, Ryan told Jones he was heading to Jonestown that afternoon, whether he liked it or not. Jones reluctantly agreed and immediately called his cult together for an impromptu meeting. They were going to prepare for Ryan's tour. This next section, I'm going to skip over a ton of details, but this is absolutely the most documented part of our story. But if you want more information, there's plenty of good documentaries out there, uh, as well as several good books. Raven is a good book that a lot of people use as their primary source for what went down during here. It was written by one of the journalists. Jonestown Paradise Lost is a pretty good documentary as well. And it has interviews with Jim Jones' son, who gives a lot of insight into what was going on before Ryan arrived. But let's get back to Leo Ryan. Ryan and his crew landed on a nearby airfield. A dump truck driven by members of the People's Temple picks them up and brings them over. They pass by a sign that says People's Temple Agricultural Project, and Jonestown comes into view. The village is actually fairly impressive, considering they had started from nothing just four years prior. Ryan's crew went towards the town center, where Ryan and Spear immediately began conducting interviews. Journalists began interviewing Jones, members of the church, and taking photos. The concerned relatives found their family members and chatted with each other. Spear received her first hint that things were wrong, a confirmation of the reports that several escaped members of the temple had made. Jim Jones dyed his sideburns jet black. This was a consistent part of some of the worst stories of the church's abuses. They also noticed something very strange. Every single person they interviewed gave pretty much the exact same answer. Everyone was happy. They had no complaints. They had no interest in returning to America. The answers were scripted, exactly the same, sometimes almost word for word. All the while, senior members of the church were circling the pavilion and yelling out things like, we love it here. Ryan and Spear were unsettled, to say the least. There was also a creepy power dynamic at play. Despite Jones's flock being largely black, the leadership was almost entirely white and armed to the teeth. There's also a lot of food out to make it look like things are plentiful, but Jackie notices a woman sneaking as much food as she can into her pockets, suggesting that having that much food in one place was uncommon at best. Also an added source feeding into the ominous atmosphere, a sign above them that read, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. That night, the citizens of Jonestown put together a lively, energetic performance, celebrating the community. Leo Ryan, at the close of this event, gave thanks for the warm welcome and said it was a shame the folks there couldn't vote for him. Jones said they could, through proxy, and even endorsed Ryan on the spot. Still, Ryan wasn't really sold and clearly had reservations. As he sat back down, Jackie heard him say under his breath, We have to help these people. While this was going on that day, a journalist was given a note from a citizen who wanted to escape, at first mistaking him for Congressman Ryan. The journalist passes the note on to Ryan, but it's late and the weather is taking a turn. The journalists are sent to a nearby village, but Ryan, Spear, and the concerned relatives are allowed to stay. They retire for the night. The rain poured hard against the tin roofs of the buildings that they were sleeping in. It was a long night. The next day, Ryan and Spear approach the man to pass the note. Jackie confirms his desire to leave as soon as possible. Someone else had approached another member of the trip to confirm her desire to leave as well. That person also met up with Ryan, and he told them both they were welcome to come back to the U.S. with him. He tells them to pack their things immediately. And this is where the situation starts to spiral out of control. Seeing those two pack their bags has a ripple. People who wanted to leave but were afraid to speak up were just given the permission they needed. More and more people began approaching Leo and Jackie. Soon it became a massive crowd. Couples begin to loudly disagree over whether they're staying or leaving. Families are fighting over their kids. All of this is going on. People are lining up, signing their name onto a piece of paper that Jackie and Leo have, and going back to get their things. Jones is scrambling. At first, he was finding people who lived in the same buildings to stare at and shame members for leaving as they packed their things. But the situation is spiraling far beyond that. Jones goes back and forth from telling people that he loves them to condemning them as traitors. When they have 40 people already signed up to leave, 
Leo asks Jackie to start taking people back to the airstrip. They pile into the dump truck and begin to leave, but the weight of so many additional passengers has pushed the tires of the dump truck deep into the mud. The drivers begin to dig the wheels out when a commotion breaks out at the pavilion. Leo Ryan emerges with blood on his shirt. He's unharmed. This blood came from his attacker, a man who lunged at him with a knife. Leo and others were able to subdue him, but no longer feeling safe, Leo says they'll get everyone out that they possibly can and return for the rest later. Ryan, Jackie, the journalists, the concerned relatives, and 14 members hoping to escape rode out to the airfield, but they were not alone. One of Jim Jones' closest allies, Larry Layton, is with them. He's claiming that he's leaving the cult, but nobody there believed him. Tensions were high. They made it back to the airstrip. They had so many people with them, they needed a second airplane. Ryan performs a search on Leighton and clears him to get on board, but he missed Leighton's pistol in his search. People are having their bags searched and put away, getting ready to board the plane. While all this is going on, there's a group sitting and watching all this. Some of Joan's most loyal temple members, and they're all armed with guns. They sit there for a little while watching. Leo is trying to make plans to the best of his ability. The sense of danger is obviously quite real, and he wants to get as many people back to Georgetown as he possibly can. But he also wants to make sure everybody gets out of Jonestown that wants to leave. As he's formulating that nearly impossible plan, suddenly the armed men converge on the plane. They open fire. Jackie sees Leo take two hits before he falls to the ground. Jackie lies down behind the wheel of the plane and plays dead. After the first round of shooting, the cultists go one by one, shooting those still on the ground. Jackie is shot five times. Jackie Spear almost died right then and there, but after she heard the shooters disappear, she managed to get up. Others were collecting themselves, but five of them were already dead, including Leo Ryan. Nobody can seem to get an accurate number of how many times he was shot, but upwards of 20 is generally agreed upon. Leo Ryan had been assassinated. Murdered in cold blood, on the orders of Jim Jones. Back in Jonestown, another white knight is called over the speaker system. It would be their last. What happens next is pretty well known, but often misunderstood. People usually refer to this as the Jonestown mass suicide, but very few people truly died voluntarily. For starters, over a third of the residents of Jonestown were children, and they were lined up and forcibly fed the poison by removing the needle from a syringe and forcing the liquid into their mouths. Many adults were restrained and either forced to drink the cyanide-laced flavor aid or violently injected with cyanide. Others who tried to escape were shot. Over 900 members of Jonestown would die that day. Jones pitched this to them as a revolutionary act of defiance. He had already preached that Ryan was a puppet of the CIA coming to tempt them all to the side of fascism, and the U.S. military would come and brutally murder every man, woman, and child. An assertion with very little evidence, and not meaningfully different from what Jones was doing to them. Obviously, very few people likely believed this, but Jones was resolved to kill them all. Back at the airstrip, Jackie Spear clings to life just barely. Her right arm is immobile, and her right leg is in even worse shape, to the point where she can barely even recognize it as part of her body. She would wait almost an entire day for rescue. When she is picked up by a U.S. military helicopter... She overheard one of the people tending to her say she had about 13 minutes left to live with all the blood she had lost. Miraculously, she did live. Her wounds were infected and she would spend the rest of 1978 going through extreme treatments to save her limbs. They were successful, and though it took years, Jackie regained most of her mobility. Though, as Jackie says herself, there's really no such thing as a full recovery from being shot. This is where I want to wrap up this story. I could go on about Jackie Spear, who had a very interesting story of her own and would later serve in the same seat as Ryan. But if you're interested in that story, I strongly recommend her book, Undaunted. It's on Audible, and Congresswoman Spear narrates it herself. I wanted to tell a story because I honestly can't think of another politician out there like Leo Ryan. He was truly one of a kind. And as best as I can tell, he was genuine about everything he did. He cared about everyone he represented, he was ahead of his time on a lot of issues, and he honestly just seems like he was a good person. He's a true idealist and an optimist through it all. And in writing this, I noticed a contrast between Ryan and Jones. 
They both agreed on a lot of issues. Both supported civil rights. They wanted the government to treat its citizens better. And they were critical of America's foreign policy. While Jones took a dark and cynical view, Ryan knew he could make a difference and make the country a better place. And he worked every day to do exactly that. Jones and Ryan both attracted a lot of attention. Jones used it to prop himself up and hurt those around him. But Ryan used his time in the spotlight to advocate for those who needed it the most. Ryan died trying to help as many people as he possibly could. Jones died a mass murderer, killing himself after murdering the people he promised to protect. Most people know the story of Jonestown, but I think more people need to hear the story of Leo Ryan. In an era where so many people are frustrated with politicians, Maybe we could benefit from a good example of what someone genuine can do when they take office. And all of that is why Leo Ryan is my favorite person to ever serve in the House of Representatives. All right, quick little sidebar here. Thank you for watching this video. I really appreciate it. I'm going to make more videos like this one, hopefully, and maybe some more fun historical content. This one was kind of a little dark, obviously, but I hope at least the beginning was really fun. Uh, a couple things I wanted to throw in here. Uh, I cut a lot out of this uh, when I wrote it down. I originally had a section about his early career on the South San Francisco City Council and his fight to make sure that planes going to the uh, San Francisco SFO airport didn't fly over South San Francisco because it was causing noise problems that the residents really didn't like. There was a whole story there that got cut. I cut a lot of stuff I could have talked about with Jackie Ryan. Maybe that will be a future video someday. And I also want to talk about, and uh, just so I can pull up the image here, this uh, really cool story of somebody who sent in a letter to his office complaining about Scientologists, and he really rips into them. Uh, Leo Ryan really does not like cults, is what I've learned, which, of course, totally valid. Uh, so I wanted to throw that up on screen. The other thing I wanted to say is I'm a big collector of campaign memorabilia and I'm sort of shocked at how I can't seem to find Leo Ryan anything. I was able to find like two places that had Leo Ryan things up for auction in the past. Uh, and it's really a bummer. I really want to add to my collection some Leo Ryan memorabilia and I don't know where to get it. So if you have any idea where you can get that, please let me know. In addition, if you can find more pictures or videos of Leo Ryan, uh, I couldn't find a single video, uh, although I didn't look probably as hard as I should have, and pictures on him seem to be limited also. So if you could find any video that's not the video of him dying, obviously, uh, please send it my way. I would love to get more uh, of this man's life to preserve historically. Uh, and especially with memorabilia. If you see any, if you know where any is, uh, there's an email in the description. Send any of those things my way, and I'll be very happy to have them. Uh, with that being said, uh, thanks again for watching this video, and hopefully I'll make more like it in the future. Thanks!